live good morning merlin good morning trees how are you guys doing feeling good i'm nervous i'm also nervous just get the mic a little closer yeah. to you just move it a little closer if you're good i'm good we're all good goodness is the way of christianity i really? i don't know i don't know no i think it's the way of uh, humanity maybe <laughs> we'll get into that in the next podcast how are you guys doing how what have you been up to during the covid times um a lot of things mm. um, innovating i think it's given us so much a free time to let the mind wander and wander it did oh, in yeah. in good ways um uh, so uh, you know s- starting up something new something fresh new ideas so it's been a great potpourri of uh, learning teaching uh, and just uh, enjoying you know new ways uh, new paths That's anything it. specific you discovered about yourself during this isolation because otherwise life keeps running one after the other things keep happening and we don't think about ourselves much anything specific that visited you that you didn't look at in yeah, in, in you know, a lot of years uh, pre pandemic times you know everything was like running around so i have just had like say 7 hours to sleep 2 hours to do you know regular you know uh breakfast freshen up get ready and uh, so it was all like ta 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 you know compartmentalized mm-hmm. and uh, it didn't let me kind of loosen up my mind uh to see what i can do with just staring at the ceiling or looking out of the window and letting new thoughts just meander in and that has created uh, a new pathway for me i think mentally mm-hmm. and that has tra- translated into action so like the piano diaries happened where every song tells a story mm-hmm. so it's nice to feature known and unknown artists musicians dancers poets so i tell a story through uh, the black and whites and through the so artists. there you basically hold on to a specific theme and then invite a uh, artist to artist, be featured yes yes it's people can find it on youtube yes of course they can in fact i'm prepping for a surgeon who's about to sing <laughs> oh yeah yeah and he is an ent surgeon who also plays the guitar and sings hmm. so we choose the song kind of if we can wisely hmm. so it showcases also his journey hmm. so piano diary is one of the things that came out of yes. covid for you anything else any other creating little videos <laughs> making movies <laughs> on my phone on on the on the laptop mm. you know just generally uh giving vent to a little poetic um, me- interpretations in my head to to videos and it's not like pro pro professional but it's fun and it's did fun. it give you any sort of a shock that what are we going to do next and when is it going to come back what will happen to work what will happen to finances what will happen to all those things was it a shock suddenly Did yeah yes it was definitely it was a shock because everything was going so well you know like we had mapped okay i'll earn approximately this much season time this much off season time and i'll invest it in this i'll put it in that and poof it just went off and uh, <clears throat> but like i said it's opened another journey and a pathway thinking this one year will pass mm-hmm. or maybe two years will pass you know it could be two years we don't know how it's going to come back because artists and entertainment has taken a beating mm. you know so i learned to live with what i'm creating right now mm. along with my friends and my co musicians and artists in this one one and a half year so we're all thinking differently maybe we'll be a little impoverished financially mm. but i think will be richer for the experience yeah maybe i think new things are anyways being innovated jj is doing so much here mm. at island city studios so a lot is going on so once long ago we were in the car going somewhere i think after a gig you were dropping me and there's this thing you mentioned which really stuck in my head where you talked about how some businessman once gave you this advice because as freelancers as musicians you know hard times come we run out of money a lot of ups and downs are faced and freelancers have a tough time organizing their finances a lot of a lot of the times you mentioned something about putting 30% for one thing 30 for the other 
Can you talk about it? I've forgotten it a little. Yeah. So, you know, like if you get paid as a freelancer, freelancer, how should you handle that sum of money? Yeah, because it's very easy as a freelancer to say, "Oh, wow, I struck oil rich. Mm-hmm. This was a great gig. I've got so much money." And then they you tend to blow it into just buying equipment or buying gear or, you know, enhancing your stuff, right? Uh, your your career and all that it takes to enhance that. So, this is what I learned. if i get paid say 1000 rupees hmm. right so i break it in three parts one third one third one third one third just goes straight into saving don't even look at it hmm. okay so your 300 odd goes into whatever ppf saving savings account or whatever you want you don't look at it another one third goes into buying what you want maybe investing hmm. because if you're that type of a musician who wants to keep creating inventing and innovating with gear or whatever that goes into that mm-hmm. and the other one goes into uh living your daily life your expenses your dal chawal ro- roti kapda aur makan <laughs> <laughs> how has it been for you reason uh the covid time specific- specifically and you figured new things about yourself you're trying to change streams what have you been up to exactly um i think well you know had a plan for 2020 um and uh, it stopped in around march also um but since then um i think i've had to really um stop myself from sort of overthinking a lot and rethink everything but without the um, without a timeline there i could really you know just take the time out not force any um destinations or in terms of can i need to reach i need to be able to figure out this stuff by this time um i can just keep this very open uh, right now and not plan so much uh, take it one step at a time and let's start from home and that's when uh i would um i just began doing a lot of home work mm. stuff to make sure that the house was maintained and cleaned and then i developed a routine for myself which lasted for around 2 months um and then i started to become a little tired i also um develop develop this huge sense of respect towards uh house help. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah 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 100%. <laughs> and not uh, and and I realized a lot uh at the time uh, and and still now as well um just as you know I, I'm sorry I'm not being very articulate because uh, I think in a nutshell what I can say is I'm just being very open to 2020 mm-hmm. saying yes to a lot of things mm-hmm. and very rarely am i saying no mm. to it um and i'll do what needs to be done because um the good thing about this is that if i'm going to be struggling with anything i can do it with the safety and the comfort of my own home without having to be outside and think about work and and uh basically you know um have the the comfort and the safety of my own home to explore all these things really like why i'm asking you this mm. is that because as freelancers mm. and uh, musicians we we feel that you know things are rolling things are fine like for me also that illusion was there that yeah. gigs are happening money is coming in but then we have to make new decisions suddenly yeah. some serious ones and there's a lot of emotional decisions that to be made that you might want to look outside music in order to survive sometimes yeah sometimes you just start looking deeper inside as what you thought was real is not actually real mm-hmm. there was a gig yesterday there was a gig tomorrow the gigs were just just there you know we never thought where are they where they're coming from mm-hmm. and then they they just disappeared one day so at that point when you're hit with something this hard that your whole structure of of the way you understand yourself define yourself is broken like mine was broken 
luckily i had another support system which was teaching yeah. so i could just kind of deflect into that mm-hmm. how do you deal with that kind of a emotional hit that what are we going to do now uh, oh yeah that that hit me okay so i it was like a switch for me um at first because then i uh, the first thing i needed to do was make sure that my family whoever was around me was kind of safe and uh, was left wanting for as little as possible so the first task i gave myself was to make sure okay there was food there was this was that and you know everything was kind of moving along there but once i got that uh down to a t then i had to really face everything else also it was because i wasn't really dealing with it as such when i started to think about work to think about okay you know it looks pretty fluid for the next 18 months 12 to 18 months um the internet is a, is a phenomenal space and uh, um i started watching a lot of youtube videos on actually i started watching a lot of um um bloggers who would talk about phones gadgets and the one thing i realized about that is you know i, I love the content i love how they were talking and mm. and what i was getting out of it but i also love this whole visual thing that they had going in terms of production and i felt i felt really good about watching that and i saw your videos also well before the pandemic and i saw what you were doing and that was very inspiring because then i kind of realized that okay there's more to my work than just music um you know there's so much more there's uh, how you can also you know produce your content visually and uh, then that became my my next uh, little project so you think that when you're hit hard mm. in any way like right now it's the pandemic right yeah. but when you're hit hard basically it's a it's a knock on on your door in terms of you expressing more of your potential because sometimes like right now you're talking that you mm-hmm. started looking at video aspects of stuff mm-hmm. which you wouldn't other, otherwise no, no. same yeah. same here actually same. Yeah. we didn't look at many things we, which we had inside or we could have learned like just the whole concept that we can still learn we have to keep learning as time passes by is is fascinating and i think these hard times are basically they are kind of shaking us to know that one you can learn in a positive way if mm-hmm. i think yeah. about it of course it's it's very bad what has happened and uh, it's terrible there's there's very little work especially for events people for freelancers yeah. things are coming up now slowly alan city is putting a lot of effort into that mm-hmm. for independent musicians and everything but um, just the overall impact of something shocking it ends up being positive somehow yeah true i mean you can you can sit and cry yes you can mm-hmm. you can think about but then after you're done crying yeah you got to do something about it yeah yeah so for me it was it was a support system to be very honest um you know um my mom my girlfriend you jj because i was in touch with you guys a lot in aditya ashok also i was in touch with you a lot during this time so it kind of kept me very um it kept me it kind of kept me sane uh, a bit you know because i could i could talk to you about stuff that i was kind of interested in you were interested in and i started learning base from you uh, along with aditya so we had this thing going on and we explored so many things at the time that um fortunately with internet and with calls and with like zoom classes and what not yeah. we figured out a small routine even if it lasted for 3 months you know but the support system that i felt i had for me personally was kind of really invaluable um because i could we could always talk and then that's the one thing i kind of felt was anything the one thing that goes beyond work um anything is basically relationships and just social um social relationships um being able to talk to people you know and that energy and um um there's there's something so special about that that's always been like that for me even before mm. lockdown so mm. i was i'm very fortunate to have been in in the position where i could stay at home i could uh, you know uh, project next 6 months or 9 months or one year of how i'm going to be able to keep you know operations going at home at least and keep the house going but i could also be in that position where i could talk to you i could you know buy small cables of amazon and um 
try and set up my own little video thing to make also. something new happen yeah, yeah but it, it came down to honestly just the support system for me it's interesting merlin yeah. have you faced like you've seen decades of music industry going up and down this so much has happened yeah. uh, music styles have changed performance uh, systems have changed there was jazz by the way earlier then there's no jazz by the way i mean in fact it was pizza by the way and now i don't know what it's called anymore there's no music happening there of course it's pizza all the way <laughs> pizza all the way oh <laughs> started <laughs> so um last time do you remember something like this hitting so hard that musicians didn't have work at all never hmm i'm telling you never so this is uh this is a it's shaken the axis of the earth mm mm-hmm. you know uh, for everyone from i think from every country from every continent every small town big town i think it's uh, it's a global upset for everyone mm. and i've never faced this so it is also frightening uh, it's okay i've lived through okay these years of making music and playing at um, jazz by the bay and Oh, I think what there was another one, Raspberry Rhinoceros and yes. Ripon Club. I think Eddie Singh was one of the first pioneers to to take you know starters and desserts and club it with music. Tell tell us about Jazz by the Bay a little because how and where was Reese that time? Was he around during those gigs? Oh, it is interesting because he had just started learning the clarinet mm. at that time, mm-hmm. you know, and he did do a couple of gigs with Jazzy Joe's. with Jazzy Joe's band and uh, so that was all that was available you know i would perform almost every week a minimum once a week like i had four gigs a month oh yeah you know almost that was like a residency for you wasn't it residency yeah. and then during show time uh, season time it would be maybe twice a month and uh, it was great because it, i would do things like weather report with the big band crowded on the little bar while people are clanking and cutlery sounds and, you know and then we advise them to put drapes to you know absorb, the, the, sound. absorb yeah. the sound of the glass make the acoustics better yeah and everyone would come and there was once when i had two bass players there was carl peters and colin uh, because he says no no i'll come i'll play a couple of songs so said, do you all want to do a duo and they did that so know? carl was the the bass player right oh uh, yeah during that time yeah, everyone wanted um call you know to fret with him <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he was amazing and it got me a chance also to explore music whether it's pyro or weather report or whoever so the time uh, that time were the gigs paying enough in order to uh, you know pay your bills and all if you're just playing let's say jazz by the bay and a bunch of other clubs definitely not jazz by the bay would be i think what we what would be a similar venue Ooh. now it would be like anti social i guess no Some, no something no. like that i would say the, the little door uh ha huh, little door little maybe door? the little door little yeah. maybe like little a little door. door or piano man yes piano man Delhi. and it was a great hub mm. so people from consulates and embassies and just regular people fans would come in and and listen people would stand across and we get a get a chance to to shoot new ideas at least for me as a band person oh. mm. you know uh a score for horn sections because i would never do that for a commercial gig mm-hmm. but i would do it for a jazz by the bay right because it's yeah, weird right yeah it's the so irony. weird because then you'd explore it because at a commercial gig they wouldn't want that this nay 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 four piece band is enough for a five piece band or just a trio or a duo yeah. you know with your No one cared. We are giving you seven grand. Get fifteen people. Get four people. I don't care. Oh yeah, it was seven grand for me. <laughs> yeah. Also for the whole so, band. Yeah. For the entire band. Okay. Mm. And so there were times when I didn't take any money. Okay, because I wanted, I wanted the band, you know, to perform and get their little money. So transportation, you'd hardly spend, say maybe two <laughs> hundred or something. That's you still true. earn. So I'd pay everyone say one and a half thousand per head. Right. We'd get great food. Fabulous yeah. food. There were coupons for Pina alcohol, Coladas. Pina for the musicians, you know, and and yeah. plus you get snacks and people would parcel their food and take it home, you know. So did you have uh, rehearsals or were you doing things on the fly? Definitely rehearsals. Oh. Mm. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of rehearsals, and home in the house itself, mm-hmm. and uh, the number of chais my mom spilt <laughs> on the floor. 
So, yeah, because we had to explore, right? New sounds. Suddenly it would be, yeah. say, Vivian Bocha with Soul Shakti or, you know, the big band or just Soul Yatra instrumental. So it saw me through various bands, various sounds, and it was so enriching, sort of, because thanks to that, years later, you know, we've done the big band, mm. right? Um, the tributes, the award, I mean, the Filmitronics to just tribute bands. Uh, it was it was wonderful to have that kind of sound, theatrical sounds. I did like um, theater, mixed theater with uh, with music and drama. That spilled and went on to Blue Frog, hmm. you know. Then the next venue was Blue Frog with a huge stage, yeah. which gave you a chance to really explore different dimensions as a musician uh, with great sound, great lights, right mm -hmm. from Jazz by the which, which didn't have all of that. People would complain. The bass is too loud. The drums are too loud. Everything was too loud. Cut, cut to Blue Frog. Fabulous. International platform. In a different way. Blue, even Jazz by the Bay was. But this was different. There was Raspberry Rhinoceros. I remember getting uh, 15,000. I did this show with Vivian. We had the whole horn section. I had to hire a grand piano. The grand piano cost me 12 or 13,000. Mm. We put in our money. <laughs> you know? to get that piano. But sometimes that's the right thing to do, no? Yeah. That the show is, is above everything. And Thank the, you. Yeah. It's to serve the music, yeah. not yourself. So yeah. the, the process I wanted to, you know, ask Reese a little about, one is that you see your mom doing all these great things and uh, you're... Not great? Not great? Oh, come on. Oh, we, we'll be the judge of that, mom. Don't. Don't worry. Come on, Will. We've already mentioned so many great things you've just done. There's so much you've done. And I'll, I'll come to the rest of the stuff also. But, uh, like, as being part of a family where there's music happening all the time, it's got its benefits where you learn so much in terms of your ear develops itself oh, yeah. way faster, right? You already know what uh, music sounds like, what a mode sounds like, what funk sounds like, even if you don't know how to name it. Mm -hmm. But when somebody tells you a name for something, you are you're good. You're like okay. I still don't know how to name it. <laughs> but still, you know, uh, there's a lot that is that gets covered subconsciously. Yeah, a yeah. lot of it. Like you don't have, I don't have to sit in. Uh, uh, if if I have to understand, uh, how does jazz fusion sound? Because I grew up in a Punjabi household. There's <laughs> no jazz fusion happening there, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to spend my hours just listening to that sound. What is going on in jazz fusion? Exploring all that. But for you, it almost has that if if you wake up, you're like, hey, today I have to figure out what jazz fusion is like. Mom, what kind of albums do I listen to? And then she'll be like, you know, listen to this, that. And you, you have a whole list going on. Mm -hmm. Listen to Weather Report, listen to yeah. Earth, Wind and Fire. A lot you can listen yeah. to. Yeah. But then there's the other side of it where it also can be that the bar is set so high mm -hmm. for, for a child. Yeah. And I've known this from a lot of my friends mm -hmm. who are uh, children to a lot of people who are in the industry, yeah. who are working in the yeah. industry. Do you feel that sometimes that I have this extreme responsibility or pressure to to perform at, or outperform my parent or something like that, that I have to really do something really great. If I don't do something great, it's not good enough. Um, No, absolutely not, actually. I never really felt that. Um, Both my parents were uh, uh pretty pretty chilled and they they've been the same with me even when it came to my studies as well uh they were like you know what if you fail don't do anything to yourself it's fine it's cool <laughs> 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 um and uh and they've always sort of been like that um but yeah i think at one point in time in my life i definitely felt like okay maybe i'm expected to sort of do this you know, and uh, I had a chat with my dad in my rebellious days. Oh, I still re re rebel, <laughs> but um, uh, it's a lot more uh, selective now, my uh, <laughs> rebelling. But uh, I remember talking to my dad and said, hey, man, you know what? Maybe I want to do something else in life. I want to write. I want to write for football. I want to write for football magazines. I want right. to follow football and write about football like be a sports journalist yeah like yes. a sports journalist and of course you know i'm, I'm very passionate about football mm. and 
and they were like, okay, fine, you know, you can do this. And I was maybe around 21, 22, I think, at the time, uh, which would have been a shocker for my parents because I think generally kids have like their, you know, uh, rebellious days when they're 16 or 17. I was kind of cool and it just hit me very late. <laughs> I think what they were like, wow, that? our son is so great at 18, 19, <laughs> doesn't want anything, doesn't go out for parties and he's very really chilled. But it all went uh, south. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um <laughs> It did, actually, for like a, a couple of years. Not that long, actually. When I spoke to my dad and told him about what I wanted to do, and I was doing it. So during the off off season, I'd be watching football and writing, and I'd be interning for uh, some for a magazine called Goal.com. And I enjoyed it. And when I spoke to him, um, he said, See, son, you know, if this is what you want to do, it might take me five years to get over your decision. But you know we'll support you. But your mother, she never will. <laughs> I was like, thanks for the pressure, Dad. Um, and, but I think after that, I also bumped into into Mikey, um, who showed me a different dimension of how to work, uh, Mikey McCleary. And from what I was so used to sort of seeing and um, passively also taking in, you know, with my parents rehearsing at home. Um, my ears open to that sound already back then. Right? What was different uh, between Mikey and what you were already used to at home? What was the new thing that you learned from Mikey McClary's way of working? Um, I think I think he's got a great temperament, um, um, which um, which was um, you know I'd only ever known what my mom and my dad had done, and and the musicians that they hung around with. Right. So. Um, so for me, um, I think, um, with, with Mikey, um, I started working with him at Blue Frog, um, at my, uh, um, at, I think at his, uh, even in his home studio, which, uh, you know, where he, when he lived in, in Bandra, and I think for him, um, he, he didn't really impose himself a lot. And I was uh, very open to sort of just seeing how he worked and I try, try to let my ears um, take in whatever he was saying or whatever he was doing. I try and just watch him. And he had this ease of working. He never really got flustered. And uh, I think that was one of the one of the good things for me and also seeing how he worked in terms of arrangements. Right. Because uh, one of the first albums I'd worked on was for his Barton album way back in 2011. Um, and yeah. he also he was the one who released uh, Lucky Ali's first album. Yeah, right? he did. Yeah, yeah. The first one that that ever came out, which we all fell in love with. Mm-hmm. So is this, as you're mentioning, it sounds like he's a very systemized human being that we are going to do this first in this much time and get all this done. Yeah, I think planning. I think great time management. B- both him and my mom are very good time managers, but they go about it very differently. And uh, I. I can relate a lot more to him than I can to my to my mum's way of working, but of course, you know she's got all she's got a huge set of different responsibilities. Yeah. Um. And and something I'm realizing now also, um, that you know, okay, there's home, there's food, you got to cook, you got to do this, and then you know, all without a fuss, really, uh, the both of them. And I I think they've got this. I think my mom especially, she's got this great energy. Um. A friend of mine called it impossible energy. Uh, yeah, I can't. You know, it is. It is impossible. Which you know, I I feel like I don't really. Okay, I'm not even going to try to match up to any of that. It's fine if I can do at least maybe a fraction of that. That's fine. But I I don't. I never felt like I need to be better than my parents to do this because they've kind of been very cool with it and they've let me explore stuff. They've had their opinions, but they've never. Uh, st- impose them as facts. So when you're saying there's different ways of functioning that Mikey has mm. in terms of scheduling and all, mom, your mom has different ways. Yeah. Like, but stuff gets done end of the day, right? Yeah. yeah. I, they take, both do finish work. Oh, yeah. Really well. And I, I take in the best of both. Really. Any, any like particular thing you remember that's different? Because I know as personalities, they're completely different people. I know yeah. your mom's personality and Mikey's personality is completely different. Mm-hmm. But what is it that you're saying about scheduling particularly that he gets stuff done in a different manner? Is it too cold? Should I reduce the AC? No, no, I'm no, fine. It's I'm fine. fine. Sure? Yeah, it's okay. good. I'm just nervous. 
<laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm also very nervous. No, 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 so, no, cool. uh, uh, we are at the Island City Studios, by the way, and yeah. uh, they have been very kind to give me the space to do the School of Bass podcast. Why am I I am doing it here is right now because there's a series of live events that's going to happen. Uh, it's actually started already. 11th of October, it started. It's going to go on till 27th of December. and uh, many bands are playing independent bands if you want to check it out link is in the description of this video just click on the link it will lead you to the page where all the details are there so while reese wore his jacket oh. i decided to talk to you about this mm. so a lot of indie bands are there there's uh, nikhil dusuza pentagram and uh, the fankulos we are playing tomorrow by the way yeah. and uh, bombay brass tejas tejas is there color compounds color compound is there nothing anonymous nothing anonymous the cognac net mm-hmm. and rest you can look in the link Uncle in the Tewari, list angul yeah. tiwari of course yeah. and you can also hang with the band virtually if you want there's a, a access you can get the zoom call link the band like in the green room uh, in the old times in the non covid times people used to hang with the band after the gig so the same thing can be done here virtually so you can hang with your favorite people you can get access to that as well it's all in the description of this video we'll get back to the podcast now so what is what is different uh, between your mom and mikey's way of functioning um i think scheduling actually Schedu- particularly scheduling i don't know um i think i've been a, a decent scheduler my, myself don't drop the mic drop very hard talking about mikey yeah. <laughs> oh <laughs> for the love cool. of mike here comes a pun <laughs> Wow, you couldn't be more cl- more clearer than that. Sorry, that's <laughs> oh, go. okay, okay. Sorry, back on track. 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 All right, cool. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, I I I realized that uh, from my mom's side, not to compromise. Really, okay. I think if I can put it down uh, in a nutshell, um, my mom will do whatever it takes to make sure that um, you know. everything is organized and it's in place and that starts from the food part of it it actually i think when Funny. a gig comes in this is what <laughs> merlin does hey guys we have a gig on the 28th of november what are you guys going to eat correct she won't ask what kind of or tell what kind of set we are playing she won't say anything about the music mm-hmm. I'll make burgers. Is that all right? Yeah. You'll have a uh, veg korma. I'll make veg sandwiches for you, and <laughs> it just does. But Merlin, what gig is it? We'll figure that out. <laughs> But first, tell me, are you okay with the sandwiches? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. It, it and it starts there. And I think the the one thing that I've I've learned from or uh, seen my mom do is, you know, there's always food and and like snacks and tea and whatnot. And I feel like that's a great way to just break. the ice even with musicians that you do know because it just helps settle a different kind of nerve uh, and when it comes to t- when it comes to doing things at rehearsal then i like how organized mikey is there you know his charts are, are in place they're very clear my mom's got great charts as well uh <laughs> but uh the handful of people who can read her yeah, we her know how to read them now yeah we we can but uh but as far as um you know getting things organized for a rehearsal i like not to rush into things and mm. because my mom does so much more and does a lot of different things she's got her reasons and um and a way of doing things and getting them done i like to be a little more um not rushed at rehearsal mm. um so so um so i like to have everything down so i keep things very organized in terms of folders and you know and keep a timeline for how i can do how i can get to that point and once i get to that point just before i also what's there for food let's yeah. hang and have like tea coffee okay cool now that we're all full and and no, that's, to go that's something i've learned from you also like when i started uh, just being part of bands mm. and things weren't so organized you know like with yes. you um when i played a session for your band rhyme and rhythm yeah oh my god first time awesome. right so uh, the the email also was very detailed that this is what mm-hmm. we're doing this is what uh, will be the time of the rehearsal days of the rehearsal this is the eating time this is the chilling time yes. wow i was very organized you know i said this is cool and i somehow adopted it so later on when i was doing gigs with vasundra i would 
follow the same system that everybody should know what we are up to mm-hmm. yeah. same happened with the charts and all you know like just seeing the way he'll print a booklet first time i saw a booklet of charts was with uncle louis actually oh yeah so any gig that is going to happen it's all printed and it's all hand written because mm-hmm. he just like uh, he's written so much same like like how yeah, you write yeah. and stuff gold school gold school mm-hmm. uh, um there's there's this thing that you do merlin sonic branding for so many yeah. brands you've done it for hdfc and we talked about yeah. it yesterday vistara you've done it for standard chartered and uh, w- what are the other brands i'm not able to recall right now um mastercard mastercard you've done right and then they take that specific theme yeah uh, which is the sonic brand which is yeah. the audio brand of a uh, of a company and then they the just DNA. play yeah played across the world in different styles of music so there's one thing about studying classical music as a pianist whenever whenever i've heard a pianist who studied classical music there's this especially deeply like you have since childhood you've spent since 8 years right 15 years in classical music 14 15, 15. Uh, and you were 8 when years I was old 7 or 8 you're yeah 7 or 8, eight years old eight. so that's that's an age you started you spent so much time with classical music western classical music playing piano i remember seeing a video of hiromi and a german instructor hiromi uehara yes hiromi so she's little and the instructor is listening to her play everything is perfect because it's hiromi ohara right she's japanese and of course it's all going to be great but then it's all uh, it's not even translated actually i was watching to it uh, watching the video being translated by google in real time and some weird english was coming like how google translate so it's a video in german there's oh. a translator sitting so german to japanese is the translation right and that's the video So Hiromi is playing this particular classical piece and the the lady listens to her and she stops her after she's done she's like okay you know this specific section the musician is angry here right and Hiromi is looking at her like a child like how do you express anger in this set of notes but the moment she touched the piano and she started playing that with those dynamics and that yeah feeling that came out of the same piano was unreal to me for it was not an impact of playing louder it wasn't speed it was nothing there was something that was going on which which was sheer practice sheer hard work and you know opening a door for yourself as an artist where you start tapping into emotions yeah so as a sonic branding person that is something that people who create the britannia ting 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 a master card sound you're given briefs right that people need to feel this that they need to experience this the moment they hear this sound like britannia is so much registered in all our heads right yes and uncle louis made it yeah and he's again coming from the classical background now what i feel is sometimes that a lot of inclination is towards studying stuff through electronics <laughs> whereas if you were studying studying western classical music as a pianist you would spend hours and hours correcting the emotion right yes because the notes are written in front of you the teacher guides you through the emotion of it i haven't done it myself personally but i can hear it that it's all about executing that emotion to the best possible capacity of your own True. so your classical studies and today when you're doing sonic branding how much do you think is a it is a contributor that when somebody comes and gives you a brief just because you were taught in a certain way just because you have spent so many hours playing classical western classical music how much of a contributor is that today in your in your work oh it's immense you know i'm you really put it so well you described it really well uh i think the years of practice of studying beethoven or debussy or chopin or rachmaninoff each of them wrote music in those years and that's what i was taught by my teacher so she said can't you feel the war happening can't you feel the uprising wow she says where is it you're just playing the notes i want to feel it and she, and, and like you said you know she, there's no need to hit the notes hard you know <laughs> like if you sustain it the right way and that's classical taught you that bach taught you that mm. bach taught you four part movement okay with with just these 
ten babies. Hmm. Okay, so ten fi- fingers, fingers uh, and bass, tenor, alto, soprano. Okay, and then sometimes the bass would go into the treble clef. It right. would cross the middle C, right? Or your middle C wandered into A below the staff, you know. And then she would say, "Yeah, hold this. I want this held whilst this other finger is still playing the melody." So it was so many emotions in that, in those eight bars. So Rakhmani Nauf would write music for you know battles and wars and. And people in th- in those times didn't have social media, right? Mm. So it's just the song, the, and there was cultural, there was it was religious. There were reasons for um, economic or anything that inspired them to write. Mm. Like Chopin wrote a lot of nocturnes, so that emotion is still stays with me as a classical pianist. So when it comes to branding, I think at some point, at some level, it all comes out. Because brands are what basically, what we do as a musician, I would do, is to get the DNA of your, your feature. Like for for me, Saurabh Suman is an is a social influencer sitting right now before me. I see you not just as a bassist, but I see you or as a musician. You're a social influencer for doing something. What we're doing, you're doing right now. So what would your sound be? You have a sound. Christiana Amanpour has a sound. At CNN, you know, mm. even social influencers. So even a company has like the sound of petroleum, or the sound of an airline, because the airline would say we stand for carefree and caregiving, you know. Or Shapurji Palanji would say we are our avatar is leaders, we are innovators, and and our rasa, which is our emotion, is um, is magical maybe, mm. you know, because we we create stuff. The creators, so trapping all of that in just maybe three notes or five notes of music, and maybe a, a soundscape. So it cannot; it'll be just a sonic logo, but also a sonic soundscape, so mm. to speak. You know, so that has come to fore in many, many a time when I'm sitting at the piano. For example, Mastercard said "priceless." You know, so straight away my piano start tinkering out a classical feel. You know, it just happens. So it's just flowing. Maybe I, it came through Bach. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And uh, because it's been imprinted in my system for so many years, most pianists like me or musicians or artists, whether you're flute player, saxophone or keyboard, it doesn't matter. Guitarist, uh, it's there. The music has always been there. But how you bring it out and choose wisely the right notes. I think that makes the whole lot of difference. So, yeah. um, so it's it's not really tough because so many years of experience playing on stage, playing live, you know, studio sessions, advertising, but the classical it helps it helps in a certain way. I'm not saying do 15 years, right. even three years, four years of learning little technique or, you know, I remember. With Louis, too, he would tell me. I would say, "How do you do four jingles in a day?" Say, "You know, no, it's easy." He would say, "You know, no, it's easy." I said, "What do you mean?" So I would like see books of Zernies or Hannon or things. It's so easy. It's all there. You ju- you just play a, an exercise. You're just scaling up. Just break that down. Invert it. Take it to this. You've got your jingle. And yeah. I, that's it. But you know what? What my mom would do also at a live gig. Yeah. Um. You know, if, if someone wasn't listening, and we could, we had like the liberty to try out different things. Uh. Even if someone was listening and was playing something on the lower octave, she'd say, "You're playing that like a sax." I was like, "Hello," and she'd be like, "Play like a cello. Come on, try like a cello. Mm. I want to hear that tone." And then, then I'd try something to try and get that kind of tone. And she say, "Okay, now think like a bassist. So try and play like a bass line if you can mm. on that." This was way back, of course, but um, but she do this live, you know. She she tell me to to try out a different tone with the instrument and not make it sound like a sax. Make it try and sound like a clarinet if it was a soprano, you know. I want to hear that kind of tone, um, and it's and it's weird um, because now that now that we're talking about it, I see how her mind also works. It's always mm. she's you know kind of thinking, you know. Ten minutes ahead, yeah. Um, you know, and and her and her hands are still kind of trying to trying to keep up with her mind, yeah. Um, but 
but yeah but i think if you spend a lot of time with her so then you know how she works but um but you have to be sort of on your on your toes uh, with her because she's got this amazing energy that um that's always one step ahead really of her so um so her mind's always sort of working and i don't think the word no exists in her vocabulary because if you ask her to try and play the drums on the piano she'll find a way to kind of yeah. you know try and do that no, just the idea of thinking of you know when she's saying that think of that you're playing a cello while you're playing the sax mm. it's it's a great approach because another world opens up yeah, completely yeah. Yeah. i i used to remember i remember that there was something going on with my bass playing it wasn't i i always used to wonder why isn't it sounding like xyz when i'm listening to let's say the toot and what's different what is different what are they doing mm. what is it and uh, listen listening to pino palatino why is it grooving so hard what's going on then stumbled upon um, a concept of how important the note length is i started looking at the bass as a wind instrument after that mm. so oh. as if i'm exhaling every note like so yeah. so then i control the length of the note better and just because i can control the note length better it mm. starts grooving in a different manner yeah. oh. so it's almost like you are breathing into the instrument yeah. it's a fretted instrument but it doesn't make sense but it makes sense in my head if i think of it as a wind instrument it just sounds better it sounds better yeah. for you, some reason you said such a beautiful you put it so beautifully i think we should all exhale <laughs> exhale <laughs> well it's like we're talking right i mean so if we're talking if we're talking over one another then we can't really hear what we are saying also and i think that's what the groove is about it's like then things start to groove a little more um that makes sense and there's so much to learn you know constantly sarab i think that's what keeps us motivated because you can never know everything that's not possible mm-hmm. unless you live 15 lifetimes and you're allowed to live till you're 600 years old or something you know a fraction still so given what we have right now it's amazing google is like the greatest teacher right now so to speak that's true you know but uh, but it's important i think each of us has our own dna our own footprint that we leave behind yeah besides being fractionally good at other things but intrinsically good at one little thing mm. i think i think also you know sometimes we get stuck in this uh, trying to make things happen and trying to sound better and all that and we miss out on life sometimes true and we forget how intertwined life and music are so there was this little time i took a a break from practicing not that i wasn't playing but just sitting and practicing just thinking about sitting practicing what am i doing this and that took a break from that especially when it comes to arpeggio scales and this and that and technical exercises and a long decent decent break but i would play songs of course i'll do my sets i'll do gigs rehearsals everything i was was doing but i somehow because i felt left behind for many reasons in the past not that they are valid reasons but because i didn't come from a musical background so i thought i've already lost a lot of time mm. then i started playing like i got into playing at the age of 21 picked up the bass for a few months while i was in school but it wasn't a long duration few months that also was that you know somebody showed me hold it here and hit it here and then it's going to create this sound and we'll all play together played some metallica and metal and that that was the rap but then at the age of 21 i was like okay this is something i want to do in my head i was always thinking i'm already behind in terms of age in terms of when i'm supposed to start playing in my house nobody does music so i have to do a little too much and i i went a little overboard i shouldn't have because it's much later in life i realized how important life is to music and how important it was to gather all life experiences to have a a proper way to say something yeah right because if you don't have something to say when you are um trying to express yourself it same is going to happen in music also you know you try to express yourself you don't have much to say not because you haven't practiced enough but maybe because you haven't lived enough 
and life experiences don't necessarily mean that you have to go climb mount everest i mean of course it's a great life experience but even just the the sheer joy of having an evening walk in a park so properly true. involved properly spending time with nature or going cycling or committing to a daily joy of celebration every day i i should have done that a long time back but i was i almost used to feel guilty that time that man you're behind you can't you can't go for this party or you can't go hang with your friends and i spent too much time with music but funny thing happened when i spent more time with life music started growing of course the motor skills need its own time to improve and grow mm-hmm. but just the respect and acknowledging that i need to have my celebrations and not necessarily in an interactive way with somebody else but interaction can be with nature it can be reading a book True. something i'm looking forward to huge impact on music huge impact then you start developing this uh putting yourself into intense situations where you are like okay i don't know what's going to happen if i step into this kind of a um, a gig or if i write a song which is beyond my capabilities but i still write it i practice my own written song then i practice it enough and i'm able to play it so you start taking risks because you gift yourself some comfort end of the day true end of the day you're constantly looking forward to that you know fall back okay when this happens then i read my novel or i go for a walk and things will be different i know you celebrate life a lot right you you go to goa you go to uh, your home is there of course and then there are these little celebrations you have planted for yourself all the time you um, make marzipans for us during christmas it's just fantastic it's during christmas right it's okay you'll find it in our bag at the store also it's fine <laughs> So uh, what is your take on balancing the two right we are always confused or we are always somewhere feeling guilty that if i do have too much of fun i might not build enough of my my career and so on and so forth what kind of balance have you developed for yourself <laughs> he's waiting for the answer it's the same thing my god i'm really waiting to hear this <laughs> uh actually you know when you spoke about your journey uh making time not partying or parting i think had those moments as a teenager mm. so i read a lot i i walked a lot i had friends who were not musicians so i think in a way that helped a lot so we'd exchange books mm. we'd talk about life we'd sit along a uh, bandstand you know on the rocks and stare into the sunsets mm. and um uh, talk about what our journeys are going to be and i had those moments but then later on i think when um uh, if if there was a financial crunch or whatever then i think it was completely work 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 for me and i did find uh, moments i think cooking was a great stress buster for me so when i'm in the kitchen i just love it you know i'm creating something gardening then i taught myself stitching you know so i would i would um, say it say yeah. it say it say it say it, say it mom. come on i would try to be seamless about it you know oh. and <laughs> <laughs> but i uh, uh, didn't succeed too much then uh, so yes gardening growing stuff even right now we have a very small apartment yeah. but just you know talking to the plants and it's wonderful like you know yesterday you saw a pink flower yeah. in the balcony i remember gorgeous it was yeah so i said say hello to saurav <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was amazing so i think uh, generally maybe i was born with extra excitement in my dna i don't know mm. you know but uh, i was just happy and i think this we learn a lot every day and i learn a lot from reese too i remember he gifted me a piano a couple of years ago What did you learn from that? Yeah, he he opened the broke open the door and and I oh, said oh. yeah and he said and I asked him just I said why are you doing this? Literally, right? Yeah. He you had to break the door of the apartment. I did some 
things that yeah. the the building were upset with me for and uh, because you had to get the piano inside i wanted yeah. to that fell that fell through he wanted to give me a grand piano but he couldn't break the wall yep. so he got an upright i got an upright at the end but uh interesting yeah. learned what not to do from her son uh, so saying. he blindfolded me and and i said I said uh huh what do you want from me why did you give me something like this it's so expensive and mm. he just said one word and then i think uh that always has rung true rang true and will ring true for me and he says you gave me life mm and i said isn't it amazing i remember even as a kid he would get excited oh the green light turned to amber or to red the traffic light you know little things like this he would get excited as a child and he i don't think he remembers that but uh also spending time in goa you know learning to draw water from the well in my grandmother's house and she teaching us how how to hold the pot on our head and walk like a lady Mm. daintily oh. <laughs> you know things like that think jungle book yeah and mm. and also you know i uh these experiences of nature has helped me a lot so even if i'm closed in four walls and i'm peering into another wall of another building my mind in my mind's eye i can feel all these beautiful things of as a child going by train getting suit on my face changing from broad gauge to narrow gauge and uh Uh, you know it's amazing you know reading books pretending i'm in london pr- pretending i'm in russia and i would tell my mom this she says no dream it you have to dream it it will happen will it i would think of the un and i would think of things like that and i think reading helped a lot mm-hmm. it opened uh, a picture in my mind yeah picture i would create pictures and imagery So I think one of the greatest gifts that thing that has been with me is reading. So I would calm down late at night, read a book and I'd say, "Ah, oh, I'm going to be reading this book. I'm going to be finishing. Maybe I'm reading about Sting, maybe I'm reading about um, uh, you know, um D- Miles Davis or Sony, the man who invented Sony, you mm-hmm. know. He has an amazing amazing journey. So reading about people and how they came up, you know, in life and I think that inspired me. So for me, inspiration is around me with just a flower or my a cat in the house <laughs> or or you know of dark clouds or happy clouds. It could be anything. You know, every picture, every imagery, every experience speaks a thousand words to me and I think and, I, and the, sorry. Yeah, so that's it. I mean, there's something special about books that they make you think bigger than you can think oh yeah and uh, because whatever we think mostly is is um, kind of acquired right from our environment and our environments can be limited where we grew up which city we are from and everything so b- books really help me also um but self help books and novels are completely different creatures the way they fire up your neurons is very different because i have struggled reading novels cuz i have struggled visualizing stuff so when i picked up uh, a novel the first time been all right and if i pick up something like the da vinci code i'll be lost completely but now over years of reading a few years of reading i just read I, i'm still instead um, in fact i'm about to finish reading da vinci code i'm late to the party but whatever couldn't understand it and aditya pushkarna who's a music producer producer and um, he's done a lot of tv shows arrived and um, hustle and all these tv shows he talks about this in a very interesting manner where he's on the similar page actually as you where he says that he'll push himself into places where his mind is forced to create stuff True. so you're creating imagery you're being creative not you're practicing you're not practicing music but you're practicing creativity and you're not you don't even know about it but just reading a novel starts firing up your brain in a very different i i so many things i do and i realize i have no idea my brain is almost is getting a short circuit experience that how are we supposed to do this because we just keep on doing one thing as musicians right we wake up we practice we rehearse we gig we done maybe learn something new or not but then this book world or any other world Literally, that yeah. y- i think it's the approach 
not to think sometimes like a musician also think like a painter think like a director think like a storyteller mm. because the music is there it will come mm. so i push the music aside and just concentrate on the imagery of it and i think uh, images can fire up a million notes mm. when you were doing music for the- theater especially uh, musical theater a lot did you study a lot of uh, kind of literature like shakespeare or something like that and then you got into this or you just jumped into it and you'll see i'll i learn from the real environment and actually i learned theater when i was a teenager in college mm. and coming from bandra you know there are churches and you know competitions constant so i was about 17 or something and somebody wrote a musical it was a fic- fiction story um uh, and uh, so i did that musical the next year they said let's do an original and i had a completely live band full on theater and uh, so because thanks to the reading you know theater happened and uh, because we didn't have videos at that time right how do i do it so playing creating music for theater happened at a very early age and then i remember doing a british musical someone saw me there someone from lintas and they said let's do blood brothers let's do godspell then i met the padam sees and and then i met Na- nasiruddin and vikram kapadia and they were doing julius caesar and uh, they said you know we want some fusion so that was the first time i actually did fusion so i called up tofik i said would you like to collaborate with me on this one he says yeah of course and mark anthony anthony and brutus's armies are coming mark anthony is a singer sorry mark uh, robinson mark, Ro- <laughs> mark whoever you know uh, and and brutus that's why i got you to the podcast as well <laughs> i would have just been sitting <laughs> like yeah. okay my, i believe my, you my duty it. has not been fulfilled by guys <laughs> <laughs> you know and it was it was amazing it was it was so easy because all nasiruddin said mm. i just want a central theme i want a central theme and i used to listen to a lot of uh, who's that musician musician who did um, temptation of christ last um, no. sledgehammer uh, who's written sledgehammer i won't know very famous um, musician anyway so um so it was it was beautiful because theater gives you a chance to it was it's like a mini movie you know right it's like a mini film right and uh, i've loved theater because you can explore so much we've done bombay jazz together also mm. and uh, so i remember using a take off on chopin's funeral march you know tell a little like about that. bombay jazz what is bombay jazz for people who are listening who don't know about it okay i think bombay j- jazz is is iconic it's i think it's a milestone play written by ramu ramunathan this naresh nandes denzo bugs bargava who started doing it won an award for it also and uh, etienne cutino has directed it so it tells about a story of unsung heroes in our musicians in our business one was reese's grandfather himself sebastian de souza mm-hmm. who um chick chocolate anthony gonzalez so people don't know about them in the days gone by they were the arrangers and arrangers wrote parts not just arrange the song right but you know the obbligato the parts that they wrote were the foundation of the next composition of the next song if i am not wrong uh, he has uh, arranged mera naam jin jin chura yeah yeah mm-hmm. a lot uh, i think uh, raj kapoor also came to our little home at little flaw mm-hmm. and abducted sebastian to write the score of mera naam joker like he's given given life to people like salil choudhary opinayar naushad shankar jaykishan and but but the people know, like um, reese's grandfather yeah he was a thick jazz musician right was he i don't uh, think so uh, deep in, into in, it? yeah uh, in his own way he he did play on wind instruments but i think the violin cello he mm. scored more for you know big band okay. but he did play but i don't think he got a chance to really perform mm. because he ended up being the man behind you know conducting arranging mm. scoring with a little pencil there he would write like 20 almost scores for i mean 
staffs for just that one page mm. you know because he had it all in his mind he knew what trumpets were playing yes dixie landries rack time all of that they they were the ones who brought they it into ones, right. so it was a form of jazz definitely so coming back to bombay jazz mm. so bombay jazz speaks about reese who's actually a little young boy you know in a uh, need of equi poise okay <laughs> that's what the play says some grooming <laughs> grooming and uh, he learns from this one disgruntled teacher who's on his last legs mm-hmm. and um, then he reaches new york or whatever and very subtly we tell the story of how the musicians gave so much slaved changed the form of rags changed you know how they would score music and give color to the black and white era mm. and then that gave color you know it came into when then shankar jai kishan came in on board so starting from 1950s i think and it's a heartwarming play it's beautiful and i think so it so when they said we're doing this play i just jumped in and focusing rees as this youngster it talks uh, about yeah it yeah. it talks about how these musicians got a lot of their um experience from musicians who visited india you know um duke ellington would come down sonny rollins mm-hmm. all these guys came down um and um i think that's where their education really was it was in doing a lot of classical music uh, mm-hmm. western classical music at the time and then bringing so much of that into bollywood film scoring at least background work um and counter melodies um which just added a different dimension to music in the fi- in the 50s and 60s and 70s um and this play revolves around the story of a lot of goan musicians who came here such of work you know often um unsung heroes not you know not getting much of the recognition and then um some of them staying back here some of them cool with it some of them you know disgruntled um heading back to goa and then you know some of them just moving into oblivion also yeah. um and i think that's basically the the theme the, of the, the theme of the of the play and it and it's 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 a lot of factual stuff a lot of a lot yeah. of research work that's mm. been done by nareesh fernandez um but it's kind of woven into a very satirical almost um dark humor kind of thing um where it doesn't get too overbearing on you as the audience because there's a lot of information but it's kind of done very nicely in a way where it's there's a fictitious character uh that's the teacher who embodies all these musicians into one and I'm just the student really mm-hmm. and then I'm listening to all those experiences all those stories which funnily enough I relate to having studied from someone like Jazzy Joe also you know there it's it's amazing how every time i do that play i'm learning so much more because when i talk to someone like kishore soda about the stories back then he he'll mirror almost every one of those tales and it's just amazing what he, he, what information is there in that play and i don't think we ever expected it to last this long but it's been around 13 years and we've been doing it wow. for a while yeah. so when you're doing music for a play uh do you just write it by reading the script of the play or are you attending rehearsals then coming up with the soundscape all of that all of that so i take notes so now you know i make notes i take a manuscript or an ipad film it you know and the director usually has their vision so they'd say you want an underscore here you know or we want a song here and without interrupting the dialogue sometimes i just got to be very subtle maybe just a, a lone cello will work hmm. you know like for Julius Caesar you know i watched the play a couple of times and so when i saw the armies coming in from the stage at ncp going on to the stage so that's when i decided okay let me pan the tablas or the duff so the duff was this side the tabla was here and in the center was just this lone string theme which wove the entire play hmm. and uh, fortunately nasir was is very creative you know he's a great creative mind space and he says well then this will do i don't want anything it's beautiful <laughs> this is a chill 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 okay, you know and that theme took us right through so that one line it would be a battle that one line would be sadness 
one line would be intrigue you know so the way you execute that very one line da 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 ba da ba da for example if it's just this line the hundred ways of doing it mm. right so that's it that's the beauty of theater yeah but again your hundred ways of doing because you come from so much of playing experience is different from um, because what it is become sometimes now is that there's a lot of production i hear which is wrong there are some bollywood songs i hear which sound wrong because you yeah. can easily hear that bass is playing something else chords are playing something else voices somewhere else yeah true that's a weird kind of a trial and error <laughs> right but spending time with music playing music then producing it and getting that finesse to it yeah. as as a musician yeah you know as somebody who knows sound and is actually presenting 100 ideas to you rather than 100 mistakes that's very interesting yesterday i was listening to some radio because my phone died my battery died and i was driving home <laughs> terrible songs i heard yeah i i was laughing so hard and uh, there's some exclusive song that had come out and uh, the song is called kyun hu that's the name of the song mm-hmm. but the lyrics the chorus is made me sundar kyun hu hilarious song like it's so terribly done i can't even begin to tell you i don't think it's on the internet right now it's exclusive to the radio but but i'll when I, it comes out i want you guys to hear it it's the the lyrics are all over the place the phrasing the everything is just hilarious it's not even that i don't know what to say about a song like that but anyways whoever had it in their hands what i'm trying to talk about is that the depth the experience that people had in the past like you need a really really minimum standard to be calling yourself an indian classical musician for example or a western classical musician which involves years and years of playing seasoning mm-hmm. imbibing what's going on being able to express all the emotions that are specific to a rag and then you compose and then when that something comes out of that it's it's going to shake everything every little cell of your body now when i listen to dil bechara is a new song that rehman has released there's so much nuance in it it's so well written it's so beautifully written but you can see how rehman chooses what not to play true what not to put in there how little to have which is coming from a lot of composing experience of course but he is paid his dues to of spending time with the greats he spent so much time playing his but of course you know many people judge him in a very weird way which is that hey man you know i saw his gig that day and he played a wrong note and <laughs> he played that wrong but that's not his job <laughs> yeah he writes music like nobody else that's okay. his job his job is to compose and he doesn't spend time doing this like you know you we do like we play a gig every other day every week now yeah. and then ranjit has done that forever when you hear him play he's not going to make a mistake because <laughs> it's a it's a different thing he's imbibed he's absorbed in a different manner but that that's something i find very strange but just just the soaking yourself inside music completely and then composing and then producing it just makes the whole process so much easier so much easier rather than spending time learning software 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 <laughs> Uh-huh. You spend time learning music, 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 and then you open any software, and you're good to go. Because sometimes you think, I don't have a good sound card. Yeah, my keyboard is not nice, and that is not happening. This Daphne Sprieto wrote for an orchestra on a melodica because he was traveling, and there weren't any MIDI and laptops that time. But he had a job, and he had a tour at the same time. He said, "I'm gonna." He write for wrote for a whole symphony just on a melodica. It's amazing. How can you do that? And I mean, that's because that's because his his base and foundation base. is mm-hmm. clear. Mm-hmm. I think just like his grandfather, mm-hmm. just a pencil, oh, yeah. and maybe yeah, some people can just see that's it. That's it, and, you know, a piece yeah. of paper. And maybe he had a violin next to him, but that was it. Have you caught uh, Reese being starstruck ever? Because see, you've done music for uh, Kabi Khushi Kabi Kam, yeah. right? Yeah. So. has he had those moments where he saw some celebrity and he was like oh i i love this guy and he's dancing around when he was little of course not okay. when he grew up no he would uh, when i come home he'd ask these weirdest questions uh, for example say um, okay the prince of uh, 
Austria or whatever Prince had of, come. Prince of Egypt. Uh, no, Austria had come down. Or, oh, okay. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or someone. And it, they know you? They know you, Ma? Really? You touch their hand? You shook their hand? Like, he would get excited. <laughs> he said, do they know you? Like, it was the other way around. Do they know you? You know? Kind of, not like me and all that. It's like cool, you know? Joe Rogan has a podcast which the whole world listens to. It's like 10 million followers and I don't know, like his views are 60 million, 80 million views. Oh, wow. So his little daughter is growing up. So wherever he's sitting, no, like people come running to him. Hi, Joe. How are you? And all that. And then they'll leave. And the daughter will ask her dad, does he know you? Do you know him? <laughs> See? And then he'll be like, no, I don't know him. But how does he know you? you? <laughs> and then... Yeah, this was a, something similar with Reese. But fortunately, Reese was already on stage at a very young age. You know, I think two years, 11 months, we put him on stage. He practiced. And then he refused to sing. He wanted to play with the mic. Mm. And then... So I looked at his dad and I said, what to do? He said, bring him down, get him down. I think he just wants to play. Let him not sing. And so I looked at him and said, bow, bow. So he went to the mic, bow. <laughs> 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 so that was his first word on the mic. But he did, uh, I believe he was very musical from a very, very early age. Mm. He was humming the happy birthday with the milk bottle in his mouth as one and a half year. He was, and I, and, and on his own, he would, um, you know, he loved uh, Duran Duran, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He would sing, you know, whilst he was playing with his G.I. Joe or his uh, creating uh, those cute. Lego. Lego, Lego. And, yeah. and a lot of Michael Franks, because we used to play Michael Franks at home. Mm -hmm. And um, he would like just hum the solo or hum the piano parts and hum the background fillers and stuff like that. And. So I think that's when we also, you know, realized he's really musical and, you know. It's so the magic of the environment, actually. It's, yeah. it's just magic of the so environment. Very, very fortunate also on the wing where we live, right? Um, there aren't any immediate neighbors next to us. Mm. So man, rehearsals were in like full swing, full <laughs> volume. Um, our neighbor below was like, you know, he was a musician too. Mm. Um, and uh, my uncle. So there was never really any complaint, you know, we could just turn up the volume, have rehearsals for hours if, during lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> during lunchtime. Right. And it's um, it's amazing how blessed we have been to find ourselves in that situation also where we don't have to worry too much about what, you know, about complaints coming in. And, Definitely. And we have our own little world also. Which is very fortunate where I to used have. to live in Delhi, uh, in my building, so people knew I'm a musician. So any music related sounds, they're coming from my house. So mostly he would be practicing bass, yeah. right? But then this guy, he was a drummer in my building. Now drums are loud, right? They're very loud. So these guys they kept on telling me that uh, when you're, can you not play at night or something like that? Because they thought any music sound is coming from this guy's house. Because that guy works a job during the daytime, ah. comes back home at night and starts playing drums. <laughs> and all blame is on me. Like, you're the guy who's, you know, destroying our oh. sleep at night. So then I <laughs> I told them that there's a guy who lives there. We've never seen them. <laughs> like, we've never seen that guy only... Because he's at office all day long. Yeah. You'll never see him. He's going to come home and he's going to start bashing the drums. Kept on happening all the time. Oh, man. And the other day I was talking to my friend Jayesh who lives n uh, in the next building as mine. So he studies with Shirish Malhotra yeah, who's yeah. a brilliant multi-instrumentalist. Yeah. So he said that I, I'll call Shirish and uh, sometimes we'll be talking at night and Shirish will ask me, what are you doing? So where I stay right now, you can play instruments whenever you want because a lot of musicians stay there. Mm -hmm. A lot of musicians like you if you're walking around then you'll hear somebody play guitar and somebody doing riyaz it's fantastic it's quite cool i don't know why it happened to become a hub like that but it's become like that now and uh, then shirish will be like what are you doing it's 2 a.m and he'd be like i'm practicing like, how are you practicing oh my god yeah. how are you practicing it's not possible like in my building i have a span of time I like three hours you're supposed to play and then you know some uncle next door will go to sleep or something so oh, yeah. you can't play after that that's that's a that's also a blessing in itself 
so merlin when you were entering the industry of course it's a man's world <laughs> yeah yeah tell me about it and um, you're entering the industry was there this thing when you got your first big gig that people didn't take you seriously at all actually not really because i started playing commercially since i was 14 mm i was in school and i played in a band called forgive the pun beethovens uh. okay <laughs> and uh, so i had to travel all the way to malad i remember but so i was already performing already playing and uh, they would in fact people would come and see oh there's a girl playing the piano how unusual really and and a couple of times people said oh you played like a man <laughs> oh god because you know why i'm asking this jane getter a lady uh, who was teaching at sam yeah. very good guitar player rock yeah. guitar player i was just asking her that do women get more gigs in in the us she said no it's the other way around they always call us doubtfully they'll be like hey we have a gig can you play and <laughs> she can you play she yeah she had to send proof and all yeah. so it's very weird that people you know were thinking in that manner So that's why I was like ki was it is it the similar here or No in fact if I fa- faced any any uh, road bump it would be m- more uh, support meaning from senior musicians you mm-hmm. know when I wanted to buy expensive gear I can't mention names but when I wanted to buy expensive equipment and they dissuaded me and they'd look at me you're a girl but why do you want to enter this industry wow. you know or can you afford it you know it is it costs like 80 grand to get an m1 and and back then no oh? back then yeah and i wanted Still. the m1 and and you know m1 is a synthesizer it was a synthesizer at that time you mm. know like w30 and all of them were around where they had um, you could program mm. w30 came a little later and m1 was fabulous because even spyro uh, used it for the steel drum sound on it mm. you know that great pcm sounds also and um, So, so they said no but you can't afford it i took a damn loan and i said i will buy it just because he told me i can't afford it and the other one said you chit of a girl look at you you're so thin and this you won't survive wow. late nights late recordings so i said but you know my uh, sebastian i come from you know my partner has done music and he encourages musician no 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 it's not for you just or stay at home give piano tuitions mm. you know just do things like that so a lot of women went into just teaching because you see a lot of women teachers right. if you noticed right very few women musicians and directors but it well, never back then me. back yeah. then back at then, least mm. in back terms then. of giving tuitions and classes a lot of women yeah, teachers not so. now it's changed so uh, i think it never stopped me because my mother encouraged me mm. and so said do, do it, it. you know in, in fact, fact i got, got a job as a copywriter and and also as a public relations officer in an airline because wow. i studied um, i did my ita exams and stuff like that i did a bit of management of public relations that's where that uh, kira comes from that football journalist <laughs> <laughs> well i don't no no i don't think it's that i think um i i think um, the one thing in common between my mom dad and myself is we are all probably frustrated copywriters oh. <laughs> more than journalists mm. dick yeah. instinct even the group group chat that we had yeah. uh i gave it a different name uh, of course um uh what is that uh, heist what's that film money heist money heist money heist came much later but the group chat titling that i gave it was uh, We are Bosco Merlin in Greece. It's Moscow, Berlin in Greece. Oh, <laughs> being creative anywhere possible, <laughs> anywhere uh, and everywhere. Yeah, that's yeah. Shove it in. That's that's <laughs> that's something. Guys, I'm, that's just Merlin, <laughs> huh? That's just. Yeah. So. Uh, she's cool. She's she cracks these kind of puns all oh, the time. Oh yeah, yeah. If you if you tell my mom, sh- uh, you know, it's something you can't do. Ah oh, man, it's like you know she's firing on all cylinders. So it didn't come from the music industry much that that doubt and no, all that. No, because But people from, already saw me on stage. From the salesperson, it was like this is not part of the regular thing that somebody, some woman walks in and asks to buy something like this for professional work. Professional work, uh, not really, because even as a child, I was studying music, right? So if I walked into a shop, I played confidently, or. if i'm dealing with a client you know i have footage i have stuff i have always had stuff 
with me. And even though I've not had to hustle that, you know, I think it's just the confidence that you exude when you're talking to a client, you're talking to someone that you know what you are doing. Mm. You know what you're talking about. They know what they are good at. So if you've called me, there must be a reason why the client has called me because he believes in what I do, mm. you know. So as a fright from a teenager, I put myself out there as a conductor or as an arranger or as a director or a music composer. So I think I've shown my avatar as that kind of a person. Mm. So people have got used to my the imagery that they see of me. Mm. So if there's something that they want, they will come to me. And not just say, no, no, we'll go to this guy because he's a guy, you know. So, yes, the journey has been tough. But like people like Nandini, Sarkar and quite a few, yeah. f- you know. So we've spoken about this journey. So your, I think your work speaks for itself. Yeah, I think uh, there's this fantastic bass player called Jeremy Morgan. He was just doing a live session where he was talking. But somebody asked about how to hustle or something like that. And he said that, build uh the build a, a lot of work build yourself build your craft to attract people to you thank you so that yeah. was that was a thing which really hit me that that's a, that's a very nice way of putting it that people sometimes mm-hmm. keep you know uh just just running around from one famous person to the other famous and you know keep saying chance they do and all that so like a catch 22 situation does it become that way i don't know what the catch which, 22 is. which is build your stuff you're saying build but even to build that you need to get work i understand that but still you know? now because of the internet you can still be in a place where you can offer somebody to work together rather than ask for work right true so that's a, that's the difference that when you're just saying that please you know just just make it happen for me and this is my background this and that versus if you create something that and you can now build literally build anything you want and portray yourself of course it's the best to portray yourself as honestly as you can as an individual as a musician you don't want to showcase more than what you can do just by using some editing skills and quantize and this and that right put out what you can play even if it is not um you know, hundred percent out there in in terms of chops and this and that. But if it's honest, mm. people connect to it. Yeah. That's all any uh, music director is looking for. Any person who's trying to look for somebody uh, they want to hire, looking for guitar player, piano player, bass player. They're just looking for somebody honest that the expression matches the sound that's coming out of your instrument. So that's something uh, I saw recently, which was. Saw this video of this guy playing a bass cover. The so head is bopping, you know, but the notes are not being played correct. <laughs> the the note he's pressing and the string he's hitting is something else. So there's only like plock plock coming out. <laughs> but I think he had learned from somewhere that I got to bop my head, and that's what you do when you are doing a YouTube cover. So those those things are very uh, strange at times. You know, thinking about thinking about some some failures in life that we all face all the time there are there are issues uh, different kinds of issues sometimes you're not ready for a certain kind of gig or sometimes the client who hired you wasn't uh, he he hired the wrong person basically that also happens a lot of times do you remember any failure especially in the music industry that that taught you something that you you basically that changed your life's path completely is there anything of that sort in your life not not really but yes i've maybe made one wrong choice of getting a wrong vocalist Mm -hmm. you know on stage Mm -hmm. and then i've had to work doubly hard to make up for the lack of that sound which the client wanted you know and my vocalist was over classical but they wanted pop how did you work doubly hard meaning so then well, I had my keyboard, I had some grooves, I just changed oh. the groove and I told the singer, oh, just sing, you know, I mean, I had to salvage that situation. Yeah. And it was, and it was a sit down concert. It was not like a wedding or a party. So people are watching you, you know, and uh, so the client did say, oh, very nice, Nolan, but the singer was, didn't, didn't match this kind of gig. 
but it was it was nice you it worked kind of it worked kind of so that was one rare occasion but otherwise yes i think we had gone to um, mauritius for a mm. wedding yeah i was just thinking about yeah. that yeah and the client said all bollywood okay remix bollywood whatever so we did all our stuff for 2 hours we reached there it's all set got charts this songs lyrics everything singers are ready and comes up in the morning and the event person says acha uh, don't play bollywood huh play a uh, play pop retro uh-huh. 60s 70s 80s so i said what <laughs> the so immediately huddle 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 okay chords this groove that groove so we we structured it fortunately everyone was good and ready to yeah. adapt to the change and it happened it was like what the <laughs> yeah but you've always kind of um, kept um you know window open for these things you know to kind kind of change at the last minute and, and you're always so i said at the start right mom you know the word no does not yeah is not included in her vocabulary um Uh, which can sometimes not be a great thing but uh but for most part of it it's such a good thing because um she'll find a way to pivot and to and to deliver and more often than not the one thing i've realized through uh, through being in her bands is that most of the people that are there right now in today's uh you know today's time is that most of us are versatile mm. musicians um or we carry another bit of um uh, Informa- kind of information with us and experience so we can also pivot if we need to yes. live on stage and um and that's the kind of people she is most mostly surrounded by and I also like to kind of surround myself with with those people um most of the time um I'm, it's not something I'm consciously thinking about but I kind of found that I've, uh, she gravitate gravitates herself towards those kind of individuals also yes. you know because it's if you've done one gig but then you do the next gig with her it means you guys have something in common so if you did not then very unlikely you'll get that same musician back right. again and for her gigs um that was one one such example but even on stage also you know she's ready to kind of try and pivot and and she knows also and i think part of her experience from be it advertising and film film scoring especially mm-hmm. advertising um she um she has this knack for knowing mm. what a client wants mm. um and because she's done so much of that over over the years um she is kind of uh, ready for a situation change also yeah. and if if you ask her to deliver something super big with like three days to spare i don't think she'd say no mm. she'd say, she'd be like uh okay let I think a, there's a possibility to do this if we can get the right musicians, and and you know a big band gig can be yeah. done inside yeah. three days. But uh, it 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 involves a bit of stress. I'm not saying no, but yeah, of but, course. I mean, um, but, but it, it gets the job done. Yeah, and that's something I've learned from uh, her and you, of course. Just a second, I'm feeling very cold. <laughs> Are you on my jacket? I just increase the. Temp- no, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Worry about it. It's too cold this room. Anyways, Iron City Studios, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this just the the ability to make things happen so critical, mm-hmm. and that's what I've seen from her, from you. That we, uh, once we were stuck uh, in a situation with the bartender, something happened with the duration <laughs> of the show, something, and you saved the day, right? That was my fault initially to begin with. <laughs> so whatever it is, whatever it is, I mean that story will leave for some other time. Yeah. But the point is that when you're you're at a gig mm. and uh, some something is asked from you, and if we need to do, ideal is we all have charts, we have the brief correct, and we are performing a well rehearsed. But that's not happening all the time. So mm-hmm. in that case, what are we going to do? And there's so many times um, Merlin has called. as for a gig gone there and the client has changed the brief of course yeah. that today we want everything to be mellow and the set we rehearsed was tv <laughs> wonder and this and that and mm. and then on the stage we are writing stuff yeah she'll Got be it. like okay let's open real books let's talk about which songs do you know yeah. what do you know what do you know at at the taj it happened once yeah. at, at the um the turf Where the race courses, yes. Yeah. Mm. There it happened, and it keeps happening. A few times it has happened, 
but what it led me to understand was that this is something that's part of being a professional mm-hmm. yeah. right so especially when i was doing tv work how fast things change in the studio in the rehearsal spaces you just have to be catching up all the time mm-hmm. you can't wait for anybody to come and give you the chart and no. this and that mm-hmm. it's just happening and if you can deliver that you're hired again you're hired again yeah right if if that music director sees that guy didn't need my attention his ears were up he was listening to what i am saying and he was ready with his pen and paper to make the changes and when we played the song again everything was in place the uh, delivery was correct everything was fine and you hired again and again is this client relationship that you have always had that you have had um certain companies which call you again and again oh, and yes, again yes 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 so do you want to talk about it a little how how it has worked for you and how it keeps on creating this chain of uh, events and gigs for you yeah like you said you know people hire you re- again even if they've made a mistake so i've got a brief and then the film has changed back again all over they may not pay you that extra bit you know that extra money for redoing all of that but uh i will do it a couple of times maybe not too often and i think clients have seen like i think when i was doing a lot of advertising with uh, whether it's ulka or linta so whoever they would see how i was there from the start waiting that the film got over or an edit came in at the last minute and the frames got shifted so redoing all of that again you know maybe i couldn't just edit it because um finally you know agency was involved client was involved and it's so subjective music right what the agency likes the client doesn't like mm. so and mm-hmm. i am there crossfire you know so i have to be ready and and also be vocal about what i believe in saying no this will work this will work and find some kind of compromise and people and clients like that so as a director they see that ability in you to handle situations to change to be a be ready to deliver mm. for the end product mm. and i think uh that echoes longer even after you've left the studio and people remember that echo you know yeah. they say okay okay yes so let's call her or him again and uh i think it stood well for me that people still come i have a client who like i've worked for 20 years and i continue to work with him and the job still keep coming in and they trust me and you know you were there yesterday when he walked in you know and uh the hard drive then was not working and he was so patient he shifted the entire session till 3 hours later he mm-hmm. says are you fine don't worry take your time i'll do it so i think these are the rewards that you get from from um uh, when you put yourself out to say i will deliver come what may yeah that's true and just just the sheer fact of having honesty about Uh, everything that you are up to and being being real like not giving uh, what we call goli <laughs> that's something really important uh, the other day i had a little bit of an injury and the bartender gig was there when i couldn't make it to the was, gig yeah that was interesting that day yeah so i had that injury i couldn't make it and one of my students was asking that you're not going to the gig what's going to happen after this and i said what do you mean they'll not call you again but i was physically injured like i had a serious uh, bite and all uh, yeah you called me i could hear the distress in your yeah. voice a little and bit and a bunch of things fell apart together which mm. is part of life yeah. things happen all the time you Murphy. have to huh <laughs> murphy's law at that time only everything happened then we i had a flight to catch 3 hours later or something i remember this yeah and then i called him i told him this is the scene and he said don't worry it will sort it out and he handled everything after that he called harshit hash base from delhi uh-huh. to play that gig he went to indore directly and they did the gig and but do you know there was a a fail safe behind harshit also not making the flight right oh, yeah. just in case Th- that day because he's uh, he loves bass so much and he <laughs> loves tech also he had figured out how to connect the ipad and play the whole gig through the ipad while playing bass on the ipad so, so that was strings. so yeah you open like garage band yeah, and you get like the bass the strings yeah. the bass strings the over strings. there so then i was like okay doom do doom do doom do and so you Jov- practice like that jovian can you like kind of just um <laughs> eq this yeah cool we're good to go and then our shit popped in just before the gig was about to start and uh, aditya and i looked at each other 
we were like we're, we're kind of relieved that Harshit is here but we really wanted to see what that would sound like could you play me <laughs> do it at home <laughs> so my That's... student asking me that what will happen tomorrow like will you be called to this gig again and i could confidently tell him that mm-hmm. because i have not you know made false excuses and be given goli in the past if i tell him that this is the situation when i can't genuinely make it it's not out of uh, you know just trying to be f- sometimes people feel lazy or something or the other they don't come to the rehearsal or a gazillion excuses but <laughs> excuses but just just being able to deliver again and again and again and then one day when if something falls apart and you say that it's not working it just it's it's helpful sure. it's helpful to just be honest mm-hmm. you know i think it's the the biggest superpower any human can develop for themselves to just be mm-hmm. honest with the clients with yourself and then it spills over to your music because life and music are interconnected mm-hmm. so true and there's this so much relief and rest in it you know you don't have to worry about what you said to do and today and what you'll say tomorrow it's all going to match because your focus is on being real being honest and being you know delivering whatever is necessary for all the clients that i find very very fascinating about honesty have people with you at any point of time either of you have you felt cheated at any point where something else was promised and something else was given in the past has any of those situation yeah. scenarios arrived financially or musically or anything anything uh, i would um i would say only financially musically i'm kind of yeah i mean musically yeah, it could happen but you know nature of the game is to be prepared to be able to shift your your focus and pivot if you need to musically so now once in i'll say no to that really but yeah financially and just the way you know you've been treated um it's um um and almost sort of segregated you feel the segregation sometimes between the hierarchy and the artistry when you say you've been treated do you feel it's uh, the person who has hired you it's that person's responsibility about your treatment or is it the musician's responsibility to decide how they want to be treated i think it's it's a um, it's a two way street there and it's got to be um got to be on the same wavelength at least you know bare minimum you know you're not asking for the world and and um i think i think we we realize or at least i have realized over the last the course of the last 4 or 5 years you know gigging with you quite a lot gigging with the same um um musicians in a way where we figured out okay this is what um the procedure is like and then there's a comfort there but also we see what the bare minimum is mm. that we require mm. you know we don't ask for a lot but okay communication for one i think i think when there's a breakdown in communication um and i'm not informed i don't like being surprised when um in term not musically anything away from music i like to be kept apprised and on top of the information so i know what i'm getting into hmm. i don't like leaving a lot of stuff into the unknown or just hanging in the air so you'll have a discussion you about what what kind of place you're staying at where you're going to go what kind of uh, food you'll get all those discussions you're mentioning that's your um, communication i normally in, include that in my in my tech writer hmm. so it just be like a basic one okay cool you just let me know where we're staying what time we're flying out um and if there's a per diem to that or not um and um just so i'll ask them for the information and if they can't give it to me at the time that's fine but i'll ask them for it at least 3 days before 2 days before if it's not all divulged that's still fine that at least i know what i'm signing up for mm. you know if i don't know what i'm signing up for and i get into a bit of trouble then i can i have to look at myself first and say okay did you see all these things or were you too hasty or were you too lazy to sort of um you know look into these things i'll look at myself and see what i could have asked for where i could have communicated better mm. and if i did and then they haven't reciprocated the same way um there's always we can always repair that that's still fine but then when when an ego gets in in the way of that then it's kind of irreparable after that point um you know because 
for whatever reasons, you can have allegiances towards your manager or vice versa, and you know. That's a nice perspective. If you're aware of what you're getting into, hmm. yeah, and you consciously step into it, then it's it's all right. Maybe on the part yeah. part of the artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to look at yourself first, mm. definitely, and at least yeah. I I try to. But still, you make it clear for for the client that at least I know what you are going to serve me. If you don't serve me that, then I can argue with about something. Right? Yeah, I'm, so you're kind of setting up terms. Yeah, man. You know, just communication. I think is the first thing, um, mm. and that's yeah. the key thing. Especially for, if you're on your me. own, no? If you're yeah. dealing. Yeah. For yeah. the longest time, I didn't have a manager. Like so many years, you know. You still Remember? don't. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know. Thing? Yeah. Um, like I did a years ago, we did a Hennessy tour, uh, and four, four countries, countries, and we had visas only. Uh, sorry, sorry, performance, performance licenses, licenses only on the day we were playing by the, that particular event and country. Mm. And it was so tough. It was like nerve-wracking. You have four musicians and all are not on the same page. Mentally, musically, perhaps, yes. But um, one wants to wander off. One wants to, you know, stay in the room. One is constantly forgetting his instruments in the lift and something. Wow. So I like... Oh my God! It was like a little nightmarish, uh, but I had to deal with it. You know, I had to deal. It was tough, so I knew what I was getting into when I took these people. But then the next time I said no, never again. So that mm. was a really rare instance where I, you know, I faced a little bit of physical challenge, herding everyone together. But um, so I had to be a little firm and a little bit strict. But I think beyond that, I think the people that we play with also, each one is a music director, a fabulous musician. Oh, yeah. So I think there are zero issues and zero problems with artists, hmm. with artists. If at all, it would be with the client. Or, but I think even that is very clear right now. You know, you sign an agreement or you send an email. It's all, it's all there. So you get, of course, in the past, recent past, I've. I haven't got paid and it's tough chasing a client and saying, but I didn't receive Most it from the happen. client. Mm. I still have people owe me a lot. Yeah, yeah. I remember a lot, a lot till now. And so I have to be focused. It's okay. I'm going to write that off as a bad check, mm. you know, and not deal with that person again. And uh, yeah, I mean, then there's you know. some places where we just know, okay, you don't really care, you know, yeah. uh, to even acknowledge that, okay, you might want to do something different later on. Mm. So then I'm not going to invest my energy then over yeah. there. I can't get a muscle man to the house and say, Paisa de do, le to goli le do. I mean, yeah. Um, um, yeah, sorry. I was, um, that makes sense. But it, Guys, this has been amazing for me to be with you to here in this fantastic studio. We are in a different room today than the last time I was here. Mm -hmm. And uh, very grateful you came to the School of Base podcast. And um, we will do more of this as the podcast evolves. Uh, I go older, lose more of my hair, get wiser, get wiser, get sexier. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're amazing, Sarah. You're amazing. You have such. So you're so articulate. You're yeah, man. You're you're so deep, and I think it's sitting across you has been also a learning experience for us. Mm -hmm. I think that you know I. I always say when I have a lecture demonstration or a master class or whatever I'm doing, I always tell people, you know, I went through a dear friend, Clint, who let me come to Berkeley. You know, I was supposed to study years ago. I got a scholarship. I didn't go. Mm. And I went four years ago and just did a walk-in classroom with a lot of fabulous professors. And, you know, I went with great bravado. So I always tell people, this is, this is what I will continue to live my life all along this dictum, which is, you know, I tell people I thought I went to reinforce what I know but no it was to uncover what I don't mm. and if I have that in my head constantly I can only learn and get rich that's true yeah um, man I just want to say um, just how fabulous you've kind of been I've only taken an interest um, you know uh, a conscious interest into your work this year obviously because of the lockdown but you know we've been rehearsing for a while now and, and I and I always saw how you'd come in for rehearsal and, and how you kept yourself so disciplined you know okay no I need to go back home and I need to do this work this course work or I need to do this video okay I need to do this so I'm going to go back home and do it 
and i would think man you're burning yourself out sometimes you can take a little bit of a break sometimes but then i i see through now through 2020 um uh, just how much uh of a difference your your way of working or moving through the day how it helps you um stay on course and what you've done through the lockdown for me at least right has been immense man you've been like a like a bigger brother to me um because i could just pick up the phone call you and you have this great way of teaching with like great temperament thank uh, you man so thank you so much for all so, this <laughs> i don't know uh, i i feel like this would not it's better i say this to you because i think this is probably the first podcast that you're doing face to face yeah it and, is wow. and i yeah and i kind of love that and wow. i i just want to keep on rambling on here <laughs> uh, is that first uh, live actually yeah. the very first one i tried to do about a year and a half ago like uh, it was here only yeah but it was recorded and it came out after 6 months Monthly, for some yeah. reason no but yeah i mean i think there's just so many things that you've done and i've seen you it it's been so inspiring to see how you've stayed the course um and seeing that from you from jj talking to you guys about different things about video obs and uh lighting and you know uh, telling a story through production um it's it's been so crucial for me as as far as 2020 growth goals for me uh and keeping my eyes a lot more open and my ears also open um i I've, i've tried to take it one day at a time one week at a time but to just absorb as much as possible absorb and observe and man i've seen you doing some amazing stuff Thank this you year man. and the guys you've got on also like dhruv um you know floyd um it's so many more and i remember dhruv telling me one story and you were asking my mom about you know studio work and clients i did a, i did one session for dhruv and the one thing he told me was um i was struggling to get a line mm. figure out a line mm. and he was like man when you're called into the studio you need to be able to deliver like that you know and uh i think from that point on was that was a penny drop moment for me when i realized time is such a such a can be such a good friend to you mm. if you know how to respect it that's true. and uh, that's the one thing you have uh, uh, really begins, formed begins with how you learn and then it turns into how fast can you learn yeah yeah so true yeah Yeah, and and then deliver also, you know, and you keep time. You have more time to do other things also. Time is wealth, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. This uh, another thing I'm getting reminded of before closing. I want to mention that is this guy Scott Devine was talking about how he mm. built his business very big, and uh, there was this dis- discussion happening between him and Jamie Lewis, and they were talking about how time is limited. and it's more valuable than money so yeah. say that yeah. time is not same yeah. as wealth time is not money it's more valuable it's because time. time goes you can't get it back mm-hmm. but then scott divine had a very interesting thing to say he said it's out of context of what we were discussing yeah. but it's an interesting thing where he said that if you want more time to yourself to spend doing your queen bee role which is let's say composing you can buy other people's time so you buy a manager's time or you buy a mixing yeah. engineer's time yeah very interesting perspective wow if you want more time in life you buy time you basically have, of course have to pay people, pay people to do that job but it's a fact it's so fantastic it's a fact like thinking about it like that that time is critical but of course separate from the topic mm-hmm. that you just mentioned but it's such a it was quite an eye opener for me to hear it like that you know some people sometimes they put these words together so beautifully and that's what he did he said that buy other people's time to free your own time and of course you'll need investment and money for this guys grateful yeah thankful same, grateful very happy exhale <laughs> exhale so um, At some point, I'll have an outro music to this podcast. Today, it's okay. not there, so I'll just say a uh, bye bye, guys. Before you go, please check out the link. Even if you don't want to buy the tickets, but still check out the bands which are playing um, at Island City Studios live from the island. Starting, it has already started from eleventh of. You October. want to change that camera angle? Goes Maybe. on till. There we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> goes on till. <laughs> <coughs> goes on till twenty seventh of December. Many bands are playing. Linkin, Nikhil D'Souza, Pentagram, 
many others link is in the description below of this video thank you so much for coming bye bye lots of love to everybody thanks arab thank, thank you. you guys